Good morning, Vertical Life Church. All right, so last week we had a word of rejoice, and we're going to try and redo that one. So good morning, Vertical Life. All right, so when you think of rejoice, can you think of screaming with joy at the top of your lungs? And everybody at home that's watching, I want you to practice this as well. So on the count of three, are you guys ready? No, no, are you ready? On the count of three, we're going to scream at the top of our lungs like we have the most joy in our heart. Are you guys ready? One, two, three. Yeah! Thank you, Lord, for waking us up today with the sun shining, with his promises so evident in our lives. And he is about to move mountains today. Amen? Amen. I know there's some healing that needs to be done. There's some uh, chains that need to be broke. And today is the day that we're going to reach our hand out and grab that help that Jesus is trying to give us. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your promise. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for the ability for us to just let loose and scream and rejoice in your name. Lord, we just thank you that you continuously love us no matter what we do, what path that we take. And no matter how dark it is, you always have that light that's going to shine in any darkness. Lord, right now we are calling on you to bring that light as the, as the world is full of darkness right now, that we can be that vessel, that we can shine your word and your truth in every corner of this world. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so happy to be here. My heart is rejoicing to gather with you all this morning. Thank you for being here. I just want to share a scripture with you before we get into our worship this morning because it it says everything we're going to sing about. And I just want to make sure that our hearts know what we're singing before we get into it, that we're in alignment with what the Word of God has to say about what happens when we worship. Psalm 149 verse 6 says God's high and holy praises fill their mouths for their shouted praises are their weapons of war amen these warring weapons will bring vengeance upon every opposing force and every resistant power to bind kings with chains and rulers with iron shackles praise filled warriors will enforce the judgment doom decreed against their enemies This is the glorious honor he gives to all of his godly. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 10 that says we don't wage war like humans do. Instead, we use God's mighty weapons, our spiritual weapons. And one of those weapons is what we're about to do right now. And that's the power of worship, the power of praise to tear down strongholds. Are you ready to see strongholds torn down today? Are you ready to find new freedom today? Amen, God. Oh, you're so great. Yes, Lord. Sing this with me. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how spirit fall on us. Fight my battles. This is how I 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 fight my battles. Let your praises this is rise. How I fight my this is how I fight my battles. This is how we worship the Lord. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight. This is how I fight my battles. This is how 
you're gonna hear my praises rise up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. Come on. I raise the hallelujah with everything. Everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. Oh, I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery, even when I can't see. Sing it like your life depends on it today, church. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. 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 Sing a little louder.
That word literally means to shout about like a madman, and I know that from this guy over here. He taught me that. So there can't be enough rejoicing in the house of God. Amen? No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. 
up your throne to come down to earth live among us as one of the lowliest of the low Jesus made himself of no reputation what is man that you would die for us that you would suffer for us that you would lay everything down so that we could be rescued even when we didn't want or knew we needed a rescuer. God, what is man that you would commune with us? Holy Spirit, that you would come to live inside of us. God, what is man that you'd want anything to do with us? What is man that you would just want to talk with us? You just want to walk with us. You just want us to share our cares and our burdens and our thoughts with you. You just want to be our friend, Jesus. Thank you for looking down and believing that we are worth it. Even as your church, sometimes we don't feel worth it. That's not who you say we are. God, I'm glad that you said I was worth it. I'm glad that every day you say I'm worth it to you. Break through today, God, with that truth of worthiness over your church today, God. The Lord has made you worthy. So strip off your old rags and be dressed in the robes of righteousness that he has for you today because shame and guilt and condemnation have no place in the people of God. For whom the Son is set free is free. Indeed, you are free today. under the shame of your past mistakes you don't have to live under the guilt of your sins that you even committed this morning because they've already been forgiven you are seated in the high places with Jesus Christ in the heavenlies next to the th very throne of God don't you know that's who you are church don't you know that's our reason to sing this morning? Because we've been washed, we've been made new today. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you haven't torn down, coming after me, and you'll keep doing it. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Oh, you never stop. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Hopelessness, get out in the name of Jesus. Unbelief, get out in the name of Jesus. Doubt, you have to go in the name of Jesus. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down. Shadow, you won't light up, mountain, you won't climb up. 
just receive your love today in a new way, in a fresh way. Break off all of our unbelief, God, all of our doubt, all of our fear, everything that holds us back. Let us run into your arms today with a reckless abandon. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, God, for being in this place, for being among us, for raising us up as true worshipers. Jesus said there's a day coming. This is something he said 2,000 years ago. He said there's a day coming when true worshipers will arise and they'll worship in spirit and truth. And this conversation is found in John 4 as he's having this conversation with this woman who is asking him, where, do, where are we supposed to worship, in the temple in Jerusalem or uh, in Samaria on, on Mount Gerizim? And there's this battle between religious acceptance, religious tradition, you know, expectations from people and from men. And they're like, how do we do this? Well, how do we do it right? How do we know we're doing it right? And Jesus said, you know, there's a day coming when it won't matter where you worship. True worshipers will arise in spirit with all their heart and in truth, according to the word of God, according to the truth, who is Jesus Christ the Lord. And any time two or more gathered in his name, that's where God is. You don't have to go to a place. You don't have to be a part of a certain family. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, and you believe on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're a child of God, and wherever you go, the Father is right there with you. It's so amazing. Thank you for being here. It's no coincidence that everyone that is here today is here today. And I am honored to be here with you and encouraged by your presence and encourages us when you choose to gather with us on Sunday mornings. And for those that are online, those that are watching, we're encouraged by your presence and your engagement. And uh, we're so thankful that you are with us today. We believe everyone matters to God. In this day and age, that is a message that needs to be proclaimed. Everyone matters to God. And there are various things going on in this world, which is why I believe this message in this series has come at just the right time. It's pertinent, especially in the times that we're living now, as we're talking about God's will to heal, that his plan, his will, his vision for the world is for the healing of the nations, that we'd be whole, mind, body, and soul. And he sent Jesus to unleash the catalytic event that would bring that vision into fruition. And this is something that is very near and dear to God's heart. And so I believe that now more than ever, believers need to arise and take their place in the kingdom of God. It's not about where you worship or how you worship. It's about who you worship. 
And if he lives in you, that should be evident in your life. It should be on your lips. Just like my wife read in Psalm 149, let the praise of God be on their lips and a two-edged sword in their hand. But far too often we have believers who are tight-lipped. And we wonder why the world is the way it is. We have an enemy, we face an enemy that excels at division. If he can't divide the nation, he'll divide the church. If he can't divide the church, he'll divide your home. He's going to divide wherever he is. And that's why in Proverbs, the proverb says, there are seven things the Lord hates, one of which is someone who sows discord into a family. God hates division. That's why the Holy Spirit unites. He doesn't divide. One thing unites all of humanity, red and yellow, black and white, they are all precious in his sight. What unites us? It is the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the equal playing field. It's where the rich have to bow to, the impoverished, those who are in poverty and destitute have to crawl to. It's the place we all have to gather in the same place to encounter a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no division in the Lord. It's an equal playing field. Our enemy excels at division, discord, anger, hate, violence, everything he can do, Jesus said, to steal, kill, and destroy. This is all he wants to do. God created the earth. He created it and said it is good. And the enemy looked at it and says, well, I can do something about that. And he's trying to destroy everything God has made, which is why in our day and age, if your response to injustice, and I want to say this very clearly, if your response to injustice, the church should respond to injustice. Micah 6, 8 says, I will show thee, O man, what the Lord requires of you, to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Justice ought to be in the heartbeat of every believer. But if your response to justice includes stealing, killing, or destroying, you are not on the right side. I will walk down a street with anyone standing up for justice, but the minute you side with the enemy, I am in opposition to you. Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. Bless those that despitefully use you. Turn the other cheek. Our response to hate is not more hate. It is demonstrating the love of God as he proclaimed it through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today we're getting to another area, really the last two of the six reasons why we've been discussing why when we pray for healing, often the people go unhealed, why God heals some and doesn't heal others. We're really getting into the last two areas that come under this umbrella of spiritual warfare. We are involved, as believers in Christ, we are involved in a spiritual battle every day of our lives, every moment of our lives. Ephesians 6.12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not people that are the problem. It's the person or the power behind the people that are the problem. This is an umbrella of spiritual warfare, and this is the current event in our nation. It's the perfect illustration as we're looking at the protests. It is not really a stance against uh, justice. It is an evident reality an evidential reality of the truth that if we're not walking in the truth we will fall prey to anything and this is why the enemy is a deceiver he lies he deceives so he can lead us to our own demise the enemy is sowing a lie and fueling a victim mentality not just in one area of the culture but in a lot of areas of the culture this victim mentality that says i've been wronged and i deserve more than i deserve Americans keep themselves bound to the limits of this stronghold, this lie, holding back their success, as well as creating future enemies and people that aren't enemies. They're risking their lives to try to save yours. By and large, what we see in our world today, what has morphed from peaceful protests into violent fits of rage, all in the name of racism, what we see is really the reality of the lie of the enemy. It's a belief in systemic lies that sow nothing but fear, hate, and rebellion. The Bible teaches us in Romans, Paul tells us to respect authority. When our government is leading us, 
we have to recognize that God has placed them there. This is why it's a sin to decry your government. And I'm not saying we have to agree with everything they say, but it's just as wrong to talk bad about Trump as it was to talk about Barack Obama. It doesn't matter who's in the office. They're appointed there by God to exact his will in the nation. We are to respect, to honor those that are above us. And when they are leading us, and it's not in conflict from, in, with God's will in the word of God, we are to submit to the powers above. And the Bible tells us that if you commit a crime and you reap consequences for that crime, it's not injustice. It's merely the consequences of your actions. But our enemy would like to twist that and create falsehoods to create victims and fuel rage, hate, and division. Again, Ephesians 6.12 says, We're fighting not against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers. This is the reality behind the reality. If you're watching the news and you're seeing everything unfold, don't let your mind or your heart focus on an individual or a group. Let it focus on the one who's really in charge. There are spiritual powers behind our culture, demonic forces we press up against every day of our lives, and we can see their handiwork just as we look out into the world and in, in the things that we take place. The Bible reveals to us really three main spiritual powers in this world. They're the unholy trinity that have influence over the entire planet, and we can see a lot of their handiwork in our nation today. The first is Baal. You hear a lot about Baal in the Old Testament. The Israelites were always against people who worshiped this God. Baal was the Moabite God considered from the people who worshiped him to be the Lord of the earth. Scripture also calls him Satan. The Bible calls him by many names. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul writes to the church. He says, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commanders of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Another translation will call him the prince and power of the air. He is the commander. He is the top demonic force in the world. All other spirits are subject to him in the demonic realm. And he is the one who is the leader of those who are in rebellion against God, the prince and power of the air. He is the devil. In mythology, he is also called by other names like Zeus and Thor those popularly depicted in pop culture. But he is the ruler of the culture, master of the rebellious. He is the spirit behind the occult and the antichrist. He is the adversary to Jesus, everything that opposes Christ the Lord. In 1 John 4, 3, it, the Bible tells us there's a spirit of antichrist. It's the spirit that blinds the minds of men to, to believe that Jesus never even existed or walked the earth. It's the spirit of Antichrist, and the devil is behind that belief system, that way of living. In Psalm 106, verse 28, it is amongst, it reveals that the devil is about the power behind those that are involved in the occult or the worship of the dead. He's the one that rules over the culture, leading it into opposition to God. You wonder why popular culture is anti-Christ or anti-God in just about every way. It's because the devil runs the media. The devil runs the culture. The second spirit subject to Baal is the god Molech. Molech is the spirit of hatred of children. And typified in the worship of Molech is the child sacrifice. People would throw their kids into the fire to worship this deity. He's the spirit behind abortion. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 21 talks about how the death of the innocent pollutes the land. And this spirit is leading our nation and the nations of the world to continue the child sacrifice to pollute the land, to give power and authority of the land over to the enemy. And then the third ruler in culture is the goddess Asherah. It's the Babylonian Inanna called the Queen of Heaven or the Queen Mother. This term is used in the Catholic Church as the Queen of Heaven, but Mary is not the Queen of Heaven. Some say they've seen Mary or the Madonna in apparitions around the world, but it is not Mary they've seen. It's Asherah. It's Inanna. It's the spirit of sexual perversion, gender confusion. Inanna or the worship of Asherah included 
the, the first temple prostitutes that were men who were transgendered to look like women and they committed all manner of sexual acts to worship this goddess. This became famous throughout the known world at the time. Gender fluidity is not a new idea. This revolves around this worship of this goddess. She was known to transition between men and women all of the time. It's not a new idea. It's a demonic lie spread by the enemy in our culture. And these are only three of the top principalities that we wrestle against as believers in our world. And we can plainly see their handiwork in our culture. But see, even though we wrestle against these three principalities, it's important as it pertains to healing, especially God's will for healing, is because God's will is not simply to heal your body. His desire is to heal the whole world. And one day Jesus is going to say, Daddy, enough is enough. Sound the trumpet. I'm going to set up the kingdom once and for all. And he's going to descend with the shout of the archangel. The dead in Christ will rise. The believers who are alive and remain will meet him in the air. And he is going to set up the kingdom of God triumphantly on the world for all eternity, putting an end to the reign of the unholy trinity and every demonic spirit in the world. He's going to cast them into the lake of fire where they will be no more. Amen? What a day. But while we wait for that day of salvation, we live in this world, and we're told in Scripture that even though we live in the world, we're not to be a part of the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, come out. Somebody say, come out. Come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. God's will is not that we start a commune and just live to ourselves because you can't share the gospel that way. But his writing here is saying, though you're in the culture, don't become part of the culture. Don't, don't become so entangled that your entertainment glorifies the demonic powers that are ruling the world. Come out from among, among them. Romans 6.16 says, don't you realize you become a slave? Somebody say a slave. You become a slave to whatever you choose to obey. Not what is forced upon you, but what you choose to obey. We've talked in this series about agreement, about the authority we have in Christ, that whatever we bind is bound, whatever we permit is permitted. And if we choose to permit demonic influence in our lives, we will become slaves to that influence. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Your agreement with sin and with the devil will determine what is your master. And there are many lies sown in our culture, in our world, that have taken root into our lives. These lies told to us by culture are whispered into our very minds from a very young age. And as we grow up, we believe them, giving them a powerful effect in our lives. And Paul says here, we become a slave to whatever we choose to obey. The perfect illustration of this is found in Amos chapter 3, verse 3. The prophet writes this, Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? Can two people walk in the same direction without being in agreement in that direction? And the answer is no. Which is why if Jesus is heading this way and the culture is heading this way and your life mirrors more of this, you are not heading in the way of Christ. Your life is in disagreement with the Lord. When you enter into agreement with a lie, it's intended to do just that, to break you away from living a life in agreement with God's will and plan for your life and leading you down the path to destruction. Even if not at first, a lie from the enemy always leads to opposition against God. You cannot walk in the same direction as the devil and walk in the direction of Christ at the same time. And many are trying to reinterpret the scripture, even retranslate the Bible in order to affirm lifestyles and belief systems in our modern day. But if the Bible doesn't affirm how you want to live, it's not the Bible that needs to change. It's your unrepentant heart that needs to change. The Lord is clear. If you're not walking in the same direction as scripture, if you're in opposition to the Lord, you are walking away from the purposes and plans God has for your life. Plans for good and not disaster to give you a future and a hope. Satan does not mean to help you, but he desires to enslave you. That's his entire goal. John 8, 31 through 32, Jesus writes as he's 
teaching his disciples. He says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the what? The truth. And the truth will set you free. free. It's in remaining, walking in agreement with the teachings of Christ, remaining in a heart connected to God, remaining in the truth that shows you're truly his disciple. And if you are walking in that truth, you will not only know it, but it will set you free. Set you free from what? The power and influence of the enemy. Remain faithful means remain in agreement. That's how we know the truth. John 12, 35, Jesus says, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Jesus is the light, and as we walk in the light, we will dwell in the light. We'll see where we're going. We'll have clear vision. We'll be able to discern between good and evil, right and wrong, the things of God and the things of the world. Jesus leads to freedom. The truth leads to freedom. The world, the culture, leads to bondage and self-destruction. That's why Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 13 is urging the church. As I urge you this morning, Paul says, Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. He's encouraging the church, use your entire body, your whole self. Let none of your body be used to serve sin and the devil, to follow the ways of the world, but use everything, submit your entire self to be an instrument for the glory of God. And how do we do this? Well, he tells us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, the pathway to keep a pure and clean body, a pure and clean temple of the Holy Spirit is first in intentional living, In verse 1 of chapter 12 of the book of Romans, it says, So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. God doesn't want just a part of you, beloved. He wants your whole self. He doesn't just want your weekends. He wants your weekdays. He doesn't just want your weekends. He wants your weekdays. To ruin your fun? No, to set you free to deliver you. So how do we give ourselves completely to God? He says in verse 2, don't copy. Somebody say copy. Somebody say the behavior. Somebody say the customs of this world. Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world. Why? Because the devil owns the world. Don't copy the devil, but be transformed into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, after your mind has been renewed, then you'll know God's will for you. It takes a process of renewal, a process of sanctification to get your mind and your heart in agreement with God. And as your mind goes, so will your body. As your heart goes, so will your whole self. That's why Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs, guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of your life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, sanctification is not just a churchy word or just an agreement with facts. Sanctification is the renewing of the mind to break down the lies of the enemy that you've believed since you were a young child and replacing those lies with the truth so that you can then walk into the truth both physically and mentally, spiritually, and practically every aspect of your day. Philippians 2, verse 12, Paul says, Dear friends, you've always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Another translation will say, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This doesn't mean you can earn your salvation. What it means is that you need to guard yourself from being overtaken by the lies of the enemy. This is how strongholds are broken down. As you are walking with the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You will show the results in your life, evidence of your true salvation, of being born again. Guard your heart. Walk in the Spirit. Take authority. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, and we have... A lot of scriptures we're looking at today, but these are important to get a solid 
theological, biblical framework of what we're talking about so that your faith can be steadfast and strong and you can smell the schemes of the enemy a mile away. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, we are human. My wife alluded to this verse earlier. It says, but we don't wage war as humans do. We don't pick up sticks and stones. We don't fire shots. What do we do as believers? We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. We tear down the strongholds, every false argument, every lie of the enemy, every which way God, uh, the enemy has gotten man to feel like they are uh, arrived or evolved that of God in themselves and makes them feel proud of themselves. We tear those things down with the truth so that we can set people free. We teach them to obey Christ. We capture the rebellious thoughts that the enemy has implanted and we deliver them by teaching them the powerful truth of the word of God. Remain faithful to Christ puts you in the truth. And if you remain in the truth, the truth will set you, what, beloved? Free. Tear down the strongholds. Wipe away the lies. Replace with the truth. This is the foundation. It's fundamental because of the issues we face in our culture and in the world. These are not just physical issues we face, but a lot of the physical issues we face are a result of spiritual issues. Why some people don't get healed when we pray for healing, reason number five, is spiritual oppression. Spiritual oppression. The spiritual oppression or the power of the enemy, the strongholds in their lives go undiagnosed. You see, we often... Like our medical society, we often end up treating the symptom before we even find a cure for the cause. Oh, I have a cold. Okay, well, get me that Benadryl or, you know, get, get me that, you know, NyQuil, that good stuff. I'll inoculate my symptoms for a bit. I'll feel better for the moment. And what happens? The medicine wears off and we go right back to the same struggle. It's the same spiritually. We can medicate symptoms but until you take care of the cause, you're still going to struggle with the malady, with the issue. And a lot of the physical issues, even uh, sickness in the body, comes as a result of spiritual issues in the heart. James 1, 14 through 16, James, the brother of Jesus, says, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow... It gives birth to death. Our enemy is like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. He is sniffing out his prey day in and day out. He is an enemy who's engaged with us in spiritual warfare. And like any enemy or any enemy combatant, he is studying his enemy looking for weaknesses in their defense. He's looking for weaknesses in your defense where he can weasel his way into your life that's why paul says put on the armor of god so that after the battle you'll remain standing strong discerning the schemes of the enemy you see satan tempts you based on where you are weak as he studies your life as he looks at your past as he looks at your your weaknesses the things in your life that you wrestle with and that you struggle with the, the weaknesses that James says here is our own desires, things that we're naturally given to. You see, every one of us has what the Bible calls besetting sins. You might not struggle with being a thief, but somebody else might. There, there are different things we each wrestle with, but we all wrestle with sin. There's not a person here who's escaped that reality. So the enemy's looking for the area you wrestle with, and he begins to slowly weasel his way in your life, giving lie after lie, temptation after temptation, to prime you for a point where you will give in to what he's been feeding you and then open the door to his power and control, his influence and control of your life. See, he wants nothing more than to sow death into every area of your life, and if you allow him, he will do so. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, Paul says, Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a what? A foothold to the enemy. It's not just anger. What he's talking about is unrepentant sin. 
when you allow sinful desires, sinful actions, things to go unrepented of, unreconciled to the Father, when you don't make your relationships right, when you know you spoke out of line and you should apologize, but you just choose not to, or, or you did something in secret that you pray no one finds out about, and you just keep trying to hide it and hide it, all these unresolved issues in our lives open a door for the enemy to get a foothold. This is a military term that simply means to gain ground. If you look at a, a battle situation, every army is looking to gain ground. The more ground I gain in your life, the more chance I have to win the battle. And this is what the enemy is looking for. He's looking for an opportunity to gain ground, to get a foothold, to bring the attack. In Matthew 18, verse 34, Jesus is telling a parable to his disciples who asked him, how many times should we forgive? So when we think of sin, we often think of just the big ones the things that we can see at, on the external. But our hearts are deceitfully wicked. No one knows how wicked they really are. And often we have sinfulness in our hearts that's unresolved and undealt with. And so Jesus is telling this parable to his disciples about forgiveness. And he goes into the story about this king who has this servant that owes a huge debt. He was about to sell his servant into, into slavery to put him into prison until the debt could be repaid. And the servant cries out, Oh, king, have mercy on me. And the king does, forgives him this massive debt that he'd be impossible for him to pay. But when he gets his freedom, he then goes to every other person that owes him a far more insignificant debt, and he sells all those people into prison until they could pay their debts. And when the king finds out about how this servant whose debt he forgave, this immense debt he forgave, was treating all the other people in his life, he brings him before him. And it says in verse 34 of Matthew 18, And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the, what's that word? Tormentors. Till he should pay all that was due to him. And then as Jesus finishes this parable, he turns to his disciples. He looks at them square in the face and he says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father also do unto you, if ye from your hearts do not forgive not every one and their brother their trespasses. He's talking to Peter, the pinnacle foundation of the early church. He's saying, if you don't forgive my Father in heaven will do the same to you. Is he literally saying he's going to call the cops if you don't forgive and have you thrown into prison? No, that's ridiculous. But what he is saying is, I'm going to turn you over to the tormentors. If the angels of heaven are ministering spirits to minister the good for the body of Christ, who are the tormentors? It's the devil. Demonic forces. Sin opens a door, it gives ground, it gives a foothold to the enemy to bring in oppression, to bring in dysfunction. The presence of unforgiveness and other sins licenses the enemy to torture your soul. That's why when you see someone who's a bitter person, no one wants to be around them because that bitterness infects everyone connected to them. The enemy's not just content with taking you down, he wants to take everyone down in your life. And he will use the open door, the ground in your life, to sow destruction and dysfunction into other people's lives. It has a detrimental effect on your physical health. Repressed emotion, pain, stress, overwhelming stress, all of these things scientifically are proven to have a negative and detrimental effect on your body. So when we license the enemy to oppress us, to have power and influence in our lives through sin, through not walking in agreement with God in any area of our life, this brings about the number six reason why people don't get healed. It's closely tied to number five. Not only do people not get healed because of oppression, but they don't get healed, number six, because of our agreement with that oppression. The Bible tells us to confess our sins. Confess your sins to the Lord, and he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If we choose not to confess, we want to hide all this stuff, then what happens? We stop being in agreement with the word of God, and we start walking in agreement with what the devil is telling us. We believe the lies and fear over the truth that sets us free, and it gives power and influence to the enemy. Our agreement with the enemy is, and our choice to sin, allow that sin to remain as a festering wound or an open door to spiritual oppression. And oppression manifests itself in many different ways. Sin happens in many different ways. James tells us that really sin happens in one of two ways, sins of omission and sins of commission. The things you do that you know that are wrong, 
and the things you neglect to do that you know that are right. If you choose to disobey God, you know that God doesn't want you to do it and you do it anyway, it's sin. But if there's something good you know God wants to do and you refrain from doing it, that is also sin. It's not just what you do, it's also what you refrain from when we violate the will of God. For instance, I'm going to make this real personal, and this is an area that I've struggled with my whole life. When you struggle with your weight or obesity, obesity is an epidemic in our culture, in our nation. It's kind of funny when we had a, a foreign exchange student, Natalia, stayed with us many years ago. We asked her, she's from Slovakia in Europe, and we asked her, what do, you th what do the people in Slovakia think about Americans? And she didn't want to really tell us at first, and I was like, no, really, what do they think? And they think, well, we think Americans are fat and lazy. That was what her, that's what her, you know, comment was. And we looked at, kind of practically, and we're like, well, yeah, Americans are fat. Now, I don't know about lazy, but, you know, obesity is an epidemic. I've struggled with weight my whole life. If you could go back and see pictures of me 10 years ago when we first came to Michigan, you'd be like, that is not the same dude. I looked like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man Jr. And like I got stung by a bee and never took care of it. You know, it's I don't understand. It just it shocks me. I have nightmares about those pictures. But what does this reveal? See, obesity can be, can be caused by a glandular issue. It can play a role. But just when you research it, you'll, you, and you just look practically, you'll never see a health-conscious person eating fast food multiple times a week. You'll never see a health-conscious person with a secret candy or junk food drawer that they dip into every day. You'll never see a healthy, conscious person like stress eat without being conscious of what they're eating, right? How ridiculous, how confusing is it, is it to go to like the drive-thru, get the largest burger full of whatever that you can find. You know, it's the mo most unhealthy sandwich or meal, but you order the extra large Diet Coke like you're doing something good. Diet Coke doesn't do anything for you. It doesn't offset the calories you're eating with when you're smashing the unhealthy burger. But it's confusion. We think it's doing it, but it's not. It's confusion. The enemy has sown so many lies about our health. And, and, and obesity is just one of the areas. And Paul, the Bible tells us, talks to us about gluttony. Gluttony is a sin. Overindulgence is a sin. He says, whatever you're enslaved to, it's your master. And we'll be enslaved to nothing but Jesus Christ. And so there are things in Scripture that we just ignore and we deny because we don't want to deal with the issues and the problems. Like someone who develops lung cancer because they've smoked cigarettes their whole life. That's not persecution. That's a consequence of harming the body God gave you. There's realities. We agree with these realities, and then we get the consequence, and we think God's not there. No, this is a consequence to the agreement, to the lie that you believed from the enemy long ago. We deal with these types of consequences all the time, these realities, these strongholds. You see, being overweight is not an issue with being heavy. It's an issue of addiction, depression, compulsion. God uh, says uh, in Philippians 3.19 of idolatrous worship. It says their God is their stomach, their belly, only thinking about the things they crave. It's an issue of anxiety, condemnation, guilt, and shame. All of these are spiritual issues. Solve the spiritual issue, solve the weight problem. God wants to free you. There are many spiritual influences working together to keep people in a state of self-destruction. It is how the enemy works in the life of people, and especially the body of Christ. There are generational curses, things that have come down the family line because of stuff opened up in a family that can be stopped, can be undone. But when, rather than standing against it, we just accept it as the way we are in this family, then that continues to perpetrate dysfunction in the life of your family. Abusing criticism doesn't have to continue down the family line when the children in the family stand up and say, no more. There are many examples in Scripture of how demons and evil spirits manifest and what type of influence and control they exert over a person. And we're going to go through this quickly because we don't have time to dig into every one of these. But I'm going to list them here for you. These notes are also in the YouVersion Bible app notes. So if you want to refer back, you should be able to do that later today. But in Judges 9.23, the Bible talks about a troubling spirit or a spirit of ill will. This is a spirit that stirs up trouble or strife. You want to wonder what's behind the rioters? It's a spirit of ill will. It's the, 
You wonder why your family doesn't ever get along and why you hate each other and you can never do family get-togethers? It's a spirit of ill will. 1 Samuel 16, 14 is a tormenting spirit. brings about depression, anxiety, fits of rage or delusion. 1 Kings 22, 23, there's a lying spirit, sows rumors and gossip. As well as 2 Chronicles 18, 21, the same deceiving spirits. Isaiah 8, 19, spirits of divination or witchcraft or control, using spiritual power to try to control the people in your lives. And we can do this relationally where we use manipulation as a means of control or controlling other people. Isaiah 19, 14 is a spirit of foolishness. A person who lacks godly wisdom or makes foolish decisions over and over again. A pattern of bringing difficulty into their life and not blessing. Isaiah 29.10, a spirit of deep sleep. This one worries me probably more than most of these. It's this deep sleep spirit stifles your ability to hear from God and gain revelation from the Lord. It makes you spiritually apathetic. You ever get into a place where you just don't care about the things of God? Well, it's possible that there's a spirit of deep sleep in your life. Ezekiel 23, verse 8, a spirit of prostitution. This is physical unfaithfulness or spiritual unfaithfulness. It works against people and their commitment to God. Zechariah 13, 2 is a spirit of impurity, uncleanness, sexual religious impurity, a religious spirit that leads people into idolatry or not the worship of the Lord. You can see this in greed and covetousness. Matthew 10, 1 are evil spirits and unclean spirits that bring about diseases. Mark 1, 26, there's a spirit of convulsions or seizures. Mark 3, 11 is a stumbling spirit or shrieking, just shrieking out of nowhere. It could be connected with other mental illnesses we're aware of. Mark 5, 8 talks about grouping spirits that bring about an intense stronghold in a person's life. It could be responsible for multiple personality disorder or insanity where all the different spirits work together to bring about a destructive end in a person's life. Mark 9, 17 through 25 is a deaf and dumb spirit. Prevents them to hear, to speak. This could have connections to a condition we have in our day that's up in the focus of everybody's life in the realm of autism. Luke 7, 21, spirits of infirmity and sickness and disease. Luke 8, 2, evil spirits connected with disease. Luke 8, 29, spirit of power and control. There are some spirits that enhance the ability in people to do supernatural things like feats of strength, intelligence, and other, uh, other areas. They're not just born that way. There's a demonic presence that's giving them that power. 2 Timothy 1, 7, spirits of fear and anxiety or timidity or intimidation, a lack of boldness. 1 John 4, 3, it's a spirit of unbelief or the spirit of antichrist. And these are just some and not all. The Bible doesn't give us a list of everything the demonic realm does. This is just some. And we can see this in every area of our life. We can see in Scripture that when the enemy has a foothold, he can manifest his presence in our lives in subtle but yet significant ways. And not just in the realm of mental illness, but also physical illness. One of the lies that our enemy has sown into the body of Christ, and many are caught up in this lie who believe that just because they have a relationship with Jesus, that, that the enemy cannot touch them. But that is far from the truth. This is why many go unhealed, because they're praying for the healing, but they're not dealing with the cause of the problem. There are oftentimes where we, we pray and we pray and pray, and nothing happens. But then the revelation of the Spirit gives us the spiritual cause. We're able to deal with that, and then the healing can come. I had a, a, a person I was ministering to, my wife and I were ministering to, and I went over uh, to their house one day. We prayed for something like six hours. It was intense. And at the end of that time period, that person was delivered of a spiritual oppression. It was evident that they were delivered. But they were experiencing a manner of different health issues. But since we had victory there, I'm like, well, let's pray for uh, other areas. And they had a tumor just under the skin, a, um, a swelling that you could feel. And so I put my hand on the tumor, and I prayed in the name of Jesus, and the thing popped in my hand. They were facing surgery, and when they went to the doctor, the doctor couldn't find it. God healed them like this. It's amazing. But why did that happen? It's because the power behind the sickness was dealt with. 
before we could have prayed and prayed and prayed and it wasn't dealt with the, the question is was does that mean the name of Jesus has no power no it just means the will of that person was still in agreement with what the enemy was doing in their life and when that will was broken that agreement that license was torn up was shredded the power of the enemy was broken then God's healing power could do his work second Corinthians chapter 11 verses 3 through 4 Paul is talking to the church about this very issue he, he says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from some, your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. We need as the body of Christ a sincere and pure devotion to our Lord and Savior Jesus. The enemy is trying to lead us astray. And he says here, I believe that if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, a false Christ, another religion, might have Jesus' name on it, but not the Jesus that we know. He says, I believe that someone that preaches that, that you would receive them, then other than the one we proclaimed, or that you might receive, that word receive means to take by the hand, or take upon yourself, or take in order to carry away. Verse 4, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different, what's that word? It's spirit. You receive a different spirit from the one you receive. When do you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, he seals you when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He comes upon you when he anoints you with power. But here Paul is saying there's a time where you could receive another spirit. When is that? When you've been led astray. You could accept a different gospel, a falsehood, a lie, a message than from the one you accepted. And what is the revelation of this acceptance? He finishes, he says, because you put up with it readily enough. You've been preached, you've been sown a lie, you've been given another spirit, and you have put up with it, or you've accepted it, and you've agreed with it. And he's talking to the Corinthian church because they were so zealous for revelation that they were so open-minded that their brain had fallen out. They were looking for revelation and for supernatural experiences in every possible way, and they were so eager for the supernatural that they were willing to sacrifice the truth they had already believed. And he was rebuking them for being willing to walk away from the true Christ, the true gospel, the true Holy Spirit, the true way to freedom, and receive falsehoods and seducing spirits and demonic influence. This is why one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is a spirit of discerning of spirit so we can see and smell the schemes of the enemy a mile away and run for the hills or stand our ground. So another term for sanctification in our day is the term inner healing. And Paul describes this inner healing process and encourages all believers to be actively involved in it. 2 Corinthians 7.1, he says, Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us, read this with me, let us, cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. Let us. This is encouraging. He's saying, do this. Work toward complete holiness. How do we do that? We cleanse our body. We cleanse our spirit. This is our mind, will, and emotions. We cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile. What can defile? Anything that's in agreement with the enemy. Anything in our lives that's out of the will of God. That's how we work toward complete cleansing, complete holiness. You see, the struggle we have today, especially in the church, we talked about this as we talked about faith and, and growing in our faith, is many believers get in their spiritual lives to this place where they believe that they've kind of arrived spiritually and there's no more growth yet that they need to have. There's nothing else that they need to do. So they stop growing they stop cleansing and they continue just to put up with or accept the things in their lives that just aren't right and it's an open door to the enemy they accept the fear the anxiety the depression the timidity the infirmity the sickness rather than continuing to partner with jesus until their broken hearts are mended and they're able to walk free from the oppression that the enemy has been sowing into their lives and to their family for generations so if we're seeking healing or we know someone that needs to be healed and the healing isn't coming, you've prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing has happened, chances are there's a spiritual component that needs to be dealt with first. Partnering with the Holy Spirit to pray and cleanse us from what can defile both the body 
in the soul. James tells us in James chapter 5, he says, if you need healing, if there be any sick, he says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other and you will be healed. And that always puzzled me. I always wondered, what does confessing sin have anything to do with healing? It's because sin opens the door to the devil. And when you confess, you put it in the light, you break the power of the enemy in your life. When you walk in the light, whatever the enemy has his hands on is removed. So you confess, you come into agreement and alignment with the word of God, the enemy is removed, and then the healing can come. This is an issue we all are wrestling with, all are struggling with. Maybe today you're struggling with a physical illness you just can't shake. I want to encourage you that there is healing and breakthrough pronounced by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You believe that? Amen. But maybe he's just waiting for you to come out of agreement with some things, some stuff in your life you've been holding on to. To confess your sins, to confess the issues, to lay your burdens down at his feet. So Jesus said, come to me all you are heavy burdened and I will give you rest. That's not just poetic language. Sin creates burden. David writes in the Psalms, because of the sin in his life, it made him sick even in his bones. Sin creates physical issues. Sin creates mental issues. And when there's stuff in our life that we have yet to turn over to the Lord, it will create difficulty, infirmity, open the door to all manner of oppression. And Jesus wants to take that from you today. This is why the cross of Christ is so important. This is why the blood of Jesus is so important. Because he gave his life so that we could have life. Let's bow our heads and let's close our eyes for just a moment as the music begins to pr play. The Lord is with us. The Lord is doing a work even now. There's a reason why that you've come here today. There's a reason why this message was preached today. It's not to condemn, it's not to invoke fear, it's to help us realign our lives, to get us out of the world. Though we might be in the world, it's to pull us out of the world and to put us on the path of righteousness, to get us out of the shadows and into the light. There are many struggles that we are facing that are a result of spiritual issues, and Jesus wants to bring the breakthrough in your life today. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal the power of God in your life. But that will not come until you come into agreement with what God wants for you. So Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, begin doing your, your work, Lord. Conviction is not a negative thing, it's a positive thing because it draws us close to Jesus. So Lord, search our hearts, know our wicked thoughts, point out any wicked way in us and lead us on the path of everlasting. Come, Lord, and expose the work of the enemy. Shine your light. God, we prayed for breakthrough and freedom today. God, I pray that your church would desire that same breakthrough and freedom and be willing to do whatever it takes to find it in Jesus' name. For the next few moments, we're just going to go into a time of prayer. Maybe today you need to first begin by beginning a relationship with Jesus. There th there's never been a time in your life where you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Where you say, God, I know I've made mistakes and I know there are things in my life that aren't right, but I trust and believe that, that you love me and that Jesus gave his life for me and I want to receive that gift. I want to begin a relationship with you and find the reason why I was created. I want to discover why I was created. And today I want to give you my life. If you're here today and you've never made that decision, I just want to lead you in a prayer right where you are. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to do anything. But the Bible does say you need to confess Jesus with your mouth. So I'm going to ask you just to pray that just out loud but silently where you are. It doesn't have to be booming or, or where everyone can hear you. But just utter these words. And if you believe it with your heart, the Scripture says you will be saved. That the healing work will begin. Your life will come into agreement with God for this moment. And He'll begin a work in your life to bring the healing that only He can give. So right where you are, as if you're standing before the throne of God, just say, Father, thank you for loving me and sending Jesus to pay for my sins. 
I believe he died for me and he rose again so I could be saved. So today, I give you my heart and I proclaim Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Heal my heart. Save me. I'm yours now and forever. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you prayed that prayer today and you accepted Jesus, you began a relationship with God, I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you, but I do want to pray a blessing on you. Maybe you prayed that for the first time or maybe this is the 15th time, but you know it was for real today. I just want you to slip your hand up and say, Pastor Joey, I prayed that today. Pray for me. I prayed that today. Lord, I thank you for everyone that's here. God, I thank you for the work that you're doing. God, now I pray as we enter this time of response, Holy Spirit, that you begin even now doing your healing work. As our prayer team comes forward and we spend some time, Lord, ministering to one another, God, I pray that your healing hand would be unleashed. God, that shattered hearts would be mended that sickness would be healed. We bind the enemy now in Jesus' name. I bind every spirit of distraction, every spirit of slumber, every spirit that has come against the body of Jesus, the body of Christ. I pray against every troubling spirit, tormenting spirit, lying spirit, deceiving spirits of witchcraft. I bind every spirit of foolishness, every spirit of prostitution and impurity, every spirit of uncleanness, every spirit of infirmity, every spirit of power and control. I bind every spirit of fear and anxiety and timidity. I bind every spirit of unbelief in Jesus' name. And by His power and by His blood, I proclaim today your hold on the body of Christ is no more. Those that have come have come to find Jesus, and Jesus is going to do a freeing work. And so now I command you to release their mind, will, and emotions, to leave this place in Jesus' name, and you will not hinder the work of God in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you descend and dismiss your angels from heaven to come and battle for, on behalf of your people. God, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you'd set up a stronghold right here of a heavenly and divine protection. God, that your spirit would have freedom to work and move in the hearts of the people here. God, that no more would we agree with what the enemy's been saying, that we wouldn't buy his advertisement anymore, that we'd come out of agreement, that we wouldn't obsess with culture, but we'd obsess with the cross, that we wouldn't live for the moment, but we'd live for the mission of the church, which is to spread the gospel and pull those in darkness into the light. We just lift you high from this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. God is doing a work in your heart, and you need to come forward for prayer. I encourage you now to come and pray. And we've got people down here to minister with you. We're going to spend some time in prayer. And then when we're done praying, we'll receive the Lord's Supper. If you remain in your seat, I ask you to pray along with those that are praying down front. If you have a testimony to share, And there's a microphone down front. We encourage you to come and share testimony to encourage our faith. But right now, for the next few moments, you come. If you're struggling with depression, come. If you're struggling with fear, anxiety, come. If you're struggling with thoughts of suicide, come on. If you're struggling with any form of sickness, anything, come. The cross is powerful enough. The name of Jesus is powerful enough. Last week, we had someone wheeled down in a wheelchair. They left walking. And today... When I checked up this week, they haven't even taken a pain pill. So praise the Lord. God is a healer, and he heals. In Jesus' name, we encourage you. Come. Come on. Don't wait. Don't agree with that lie anymore. Don't agree with what the enemy has been selling you. The devil is a liar. When you agree with the lie, you empower the liar. So you come. In Jesus' name. I have a wonderful thing that happened to me one Sunday. 
Before Tony and Joey laid their hands on me, I had multi-level degenerative disc disease from my neck to my tailbone. Now it is gone completely. And I used to be in severe pain. Now I have none whatsoever. And thank you, Teresa. Praise God. He's a healer. It's nothing too big, nothing too small. Maybe your marriage needs a touch from the Lord. Maybe you have a child that is not, doesn't have a relationship with the Lord or a relative or a friend or a co-worker. Come on. There's too many things to pray for, for the church to be still. You come. Okay, so I'll probably cry because I cry all the time. <laughs> but um, a few Sundays ago, I received a really lengthy message from a friend. And I seen it, and I was like, oh, I don't know if I could read this right now. Because I knew it was pretty serious and deep and very long. worked myself up to reading it because I knew I had to be like mentally in into it I'm reading it my husband asked me well what did she have to say my response was I don't even know where to begin I don't even know how to tell you what I just read now that says a lot because I always have something to say or have an answer and I had nothing an hour or two went by well first her first message was I need your number I'm like you've had it okay but I, did, but I didn't even write back because I, don't, I didn't know what to say so then I seen that she called me and I was like oh I don't know I don't know I just wasn't feeling it she called me repetitively and I said okay I'm gonna answer it and it was late we were in bed I get out of bed go in the other room I'm talking to her first thing she says I need you to take me to Hurley okay why do you need to go now the things that I was picking up on was delusional schizophrenic by the enemy I'm talking to her I'm like oh man I need to get a hold of her mom you know I haven't talked to her or seen her in years I get a hold of her mom it's 10 o'clock at night I'm like what is going on with Amy she validates everything that she's sharing with me Well, I let her go. She said she's on her way to my house. Now, she lives on the other side of Chesoning. I live in Clio. How she found my house in the middle of the night with it being dark was by the grace of God. I was talking to my mom. And I go, oh my goodness, mom, she just pulled in. I meet her on the driveway. I instantly see, yeah, she needs to go to Hurley. I told her mom, if she shows up, I'll take her. The intent was to get her admitted for mental health. I'm playing along with all of her theories and everything that she's, the government's after her is what she's thinking. The security in her car is the government spying on her. I mean, this is, I've never experienced such. I, I don't know, it's crazy.
crazy. So we're driving down the road. I get her there. She starts feeling calmer. She's better. I'm praying because I'm thinking, oh, how am I going to, like, let them see that she needs psychiatric help? And what happens if she finds out that I'm trying to do this and i got to drive back with her? Because you don't want to upset a delusional person. They become violent most of the time. I did not feel that. My husband was really upset that I left. He just worries about everything. <laughs> Especially when it comes to me and the kids. So I felt a sense of calmness and at peace that she was going to be where she needs to be. Well, because you... If you're delusional, you cannot admit yourself to the hospital, to the psychiatric floor by yourself. You have to have someone else do it, and you have to fill up tons of paperwork. She had no idea what I was doing. I get her there. I do all the paperwork. And I leave. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning by the time I'm home. Haven't heard from her. I've kept in contact with her mom. They picked up her car the next day, and she said, if she did not find your house, she probably would have been dead. And she, she kept telling me, thank you. I'm like, that wasn't me. All that glory goes to God. To understand Amy and her personality, for her to even find my number, because she doesn't have a cell phone, she destroyed it, is amazing, because I haven't spoken to her in a long time. And that's all God. So I would like for us as a church to continue to pray for her. She is home. She did about 15 days, as long as insurance will pay for her. But she is doing outpatient mental health. And that's all I really know right now. She does say that she wants to come to church. So I just, I pray that we can lift her up and that her family can have the patience to deal with her. Because it is, <laughs> it's a lot. That's all I had to say. Lord, we just uh, we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus. That um, under your power, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Lord, we lift up Amy right now to you in Jesus' name. That obviously, Lord, you have plans for her. Obviously, you are lighting her path when there's a lot of darkness. And obviously, Lord, you are in full control. Lord, we lift this situation up to you in the name of Jesus, that you can break chains, that you can let her spiritual eyes be opened, and that she can be led to a place that is full of your love and your joy and your peace. Lord, that she can find victory in your name. Lord, we lift Amy up right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're all struggling. We are all struggling with something. And you knew that struggle before you even created us, Lord. You knew that we are going to struggle with the temptations and the evilness of sin in this world. Yet, Lord, you just uh, continuously show your grace and your mercy on us. And you've given us the authority in Luke 10, 19. You've given us the authority to stomp on snakes and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, that nothing in this world shall harm us. And, Lord, you have given us domain over this enemy that torments us with, with all these spirits. Lord, and you've given us free will, the free will to choose to go left or to go right, to follow you or to set our agreement in the enemy. Yeah. And yet, Lord, even though we make bad choices and uh, we're, we're deceived by that enemy, Lord, you are still there waiting for us to turn our ways and come back to you. Yeah. You have already paid that price on the cross, Lord, and we just thank you. We thank you that you continuously guide us, lead us, and show us back to your true love. Yes. No matter where we are, no matter what 
we are under, Lord. You are not a God of condemnation, but you are a, you are a God of forgiveness and peace and love. Yeah. And Lord, we just thank you. You've shown us in a way that uh, whatever is going on in our hearts right now, Lord, that you've shown us that we can come to you in, in three different ways. Lord, the first way is, is to repent. Right now, Lord, we repent for whatever is striving in our life right now, whatever that pain is, that we know we've taken our eyes off of you and went the wrong direction. What we've allowed the enemy to take control of, Lord, we repent of that right now. And then we turn to the enemy. We say, enemy, you have controlled this part of my life for way too long. And we do not have to live with this. We do not have to live under what you put us through. Yes. Because God has delivered us already as long as we reach out and grab him. And right now, in the name of Jesus, enemy, you must flee. Yes. I release whatever control you have in this part of my life over. Any contract that I've signed, I break right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just come back to you and just say, fill us. Mm -hmm. Fill us with your spirit. That if we've been struggling with this item for so long, Lord, that sometimes it's scary and we don't know how to release it. Yeah. Because we are bold enough to think that that's part of us, and that is not true. Yes. So right now, as we break those chains and as we break that contract with the enemy, we ask that you come in and fill us with your spirit. Yeah. Overflow in us, Lord. That there's no room for this enemy to, to take control any longer. That our eyes will always stay focused on you. Lord, you have just given us every ability to turn back to you. And, and we do that right now. And we do that with thanksgiving and love. Mm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, you are so good. And... Um, I just wanted to take the time. I, I really believe that I received a word from the Lord um, today while I was worshiping. Um, we were singing Raise a Hallelujah, and um, a couple of the lines say, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than my unbelief. And so I just really feel like our church has um, gone through a lot of trials and tribulations, a lot of oppression and opposition, um, things coming against us, kind of feel like we were um, trudging through mud and things have been a, um, a struggle for us financially and just spiritually, but I feel like our hearts have been, let's raise a hallelujah in the midst of um, all these trials and all these things that are coming against us. And I really feel like as we were singing that song today, that God broke through and we are having breakthrough mm -hmm. and God is yes. going to open doors that we've never seen open financially spiritually that things are going to be um, easier than they have been that they ever yes. have been mm -hmm. and we're going to have favor and um, blessing like we never seen before so amen. Um, thank you, Jesus. amen and thank you Jesus receive that to conclude our service with the Lord's Supper. So I want to encourage you to stand, make your way down here, and get some bread and some juice. And we'll pray together and celebrate.
Amen. As you're making your way to your seat, we just want to pray and bless the body and the blood of Christ because it's his body and blood that makes healing possible. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name for who you are. You are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. You are Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And you provided Jesus so that you could then heal us. And God, we just thank you that it's not just a healing in eternity, but we can walk in that even now in the present time. So God, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, as we celebrate what you accomplished on the cross and look forward to what you're going to do in eternity, as you come back and set up your kingdom, God, as we celebrate the truth and promises of your holy word, God, I pray that the power of the enemy would break now in Jesus' name that the body would bring the cleansing and the blood would fill us with that spiritual life and the power of the Spirit to walk in authority over everything that He would come bring against us, that we would discern the lies, we'd walk in the truth. God, bless our families, bless our friendships, our relationships. God, bless us, not because we deserve it, but because we're hungry for more of You. Bless us with Your presence. For it is the greatest treasure that we can hope to enjoy. We ask you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat. Let's drink. I want to encourage you next week to bring somebody with you. Because we're going to end this series by talking about how to pray for healing. And then we're going to do it. And we're going to watch God work and move. And so I just want to encourage you that this is the inheritance of the children of the Lord. And so as we've talked about ways that get in the way, we now can discern how to heal as we look at the ways Jesus healed and the way the disciples healed to encourage us to walk this out. So I want to encourage you to do that. I'm going to bless you with blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you his peace. And that next week you come with a testimony to share. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next week. Shout it on.